one, one, one more question that's, it might not be the right time to ask this, so feel free if you want to swerve this for now. But a bit of background, by the time this podcast comes out, I'll have released um, results of a survey that I did with uh, about 500 teachers replied to this. And I asked them for five phases of a lesson. So let's say like a retrieval do now, a prerequisite knowledge check, an explanation slash worked example, independent practice, and then a plenary. At, to consider those five stages of your lesson, and I asked the question, how easy would it be for a child to get away with either not listening, not thinking, or not understanding, and, and you not pick up on it as a teacher? And teachers were really good putting all their kind of ratings in and so on and so forth. By far and away, the phase of the lesson that came out with the low, with the highest chance of that happening, so in other words, the lowest potential participation ratio was the explanation or worked example phase. And I know we're going to go into talking about high frequency checks for listening as potentially a way to address that. But the other thing that really interested me from results of the survey is the independent practice phase. And I noticed this myself because when kids are kind of silently working, kind of getting on with things. You don't want to constantly keep stopping them by saying, hands up for this, hands up for that. So all you've really got to rely on is, I guess, circulation. But if you've got a pretty big class and they're working in books and quite small, it can be quite tricky to get a sense of whether they're thinking hard, whether they're understanding, certainly compared to when you can get all that data immediately from, from kids at other phases of the lesson. So I just wonder, perhaps thinking particularly about the um, the independent practice phase, what would be your way of guaranteeing that you're getting this engagement and participation there? Is, is circulation enough for that or do you have anything else up your sleeve? It's a brilliant question. I think the first proxy immediately is pens moving yeah. as soon as you say go. <laughs> um, so we have a kind of a routine in the school where usually before you start independent practice, uh you there's a clear signal so you say right we're gonna answer questions one to ten or whatever it might be uh and then sometimes we do thing where you put your black or blue pen up in the air and you're looking for 100 percent of <laughs> of black or blue pens up in the air and you say go uh, i normally then follow by saying and ah, my gold medal merit goes to uh and i just pick whoever it looks like they're the fastest to start working um and then you're just scanning the room initially to see is every child writing and if there's a child that's not writing uh you might say right i need to see all pens moving in five four three two lovely stuff we've got everyone now and one um and i don't think it's apart from maybe in the first week of year seven where they're not used to this kind of thing uh i think after that everyone will be writing um and then i kind of just stay at the front for a little bit just to check everyone is fully engaging um and then i think circulation is an interesting one uh i think it is important to go around and see what the students are doing and writing uh but you've got to be careful not to turn your back on the class and i think that's quite uh a, 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 something that i have to give feedback to teachers on quite a lot in my department um initially um then I think there's a few strategies you can use to make sure that, that there's high engagement. I think the first one is just whole school culture um, and, the, and setting them up initially. So once you've got all pens moving, the chances are that they're not just doodling, they're just, they are actually writing, but obviously you're doing a quick check to make sure that that is the case. Um, show call is one of my favorite strategies. And I know Doug Lamov uh has spoken about that as one of his favorite strategies as well that he would recommend to new teachers just tell us a bit um, about that protest for people who aren't aren't aware yeah so it's just about picking a student's work uh i would normally show it under the visualizer um and so let's say they've i don't know let's say it's some sort of uh explanation that they've written for something um you pick a student uh and you could do that at random you could ask for hands up um i think when it comes to uh, yeah and then you show it under the visualizer and you might either mark it you you model it model how you'd mark that particular answer under the visualizer um and give feedback to it live and say who and you ask about whether anyone else had, had similar made a similar mistake or had got all the key points that you expect to be written within that answer um and it's quite nice because i think it's a good chance to build a lot of buy-in from students who feel a lot of pride with their work um, so I was saying, who, who's, who's book am I going to show next? And we get the really keen ones think, oh, I really want to share mine. That's always really nice. Some people are a lot more reluctant to show their written work. 
Um, and I can understand why that might be. Um, because compared to an answer, we can be like, mm, I'm not sure, I think it's this. Having a written answer is a bit more like, if you're completely wrong, it can feel really awkward and embarrassing. And I totally understand that. So if someone's got it completely wrong, I wouldn't necessarily show that under the visualizer. Um, I'm, I, and I might ask them, say, oh, can I share? Have you made a really great mistake here? Can I share this? Uh, this and, so, and if you know if the culture's right and, and they're the kind of student that, that has that level of confidence, then that works really well. Um, uh, so within, uh, but that strategy is good at kind of generally. It's more it's more long term accountability because over time students learn. Oh, I could be picked. Um, and then what else? I would say. I think generally with independent work, when we have, let's say there's 10 questions they've answered, I will, I mean, this is going to sound controversial. I might not necessarily use all hands up cold calling. I might just pick students and say, read your answer up for number one, Josh, read your answer up for number two, Amira, um, just because it's quicker. And because everyone's already, part the participation's already done. It's already, they've already written all their answers. I just want to sample them. Um, so I might just pick students at random there at that point. And if someone doesn't have something written, uh, and it's like question two and they've had 10 minutes to do it and I would expect them to, then there would be, a, I would have to hold them to account then, for, you know, I might, you know, that might be a demerit or it might be a why didn't, you know, you, in, if that happens that you should have asked for help or maybe you've done number three and four and I'd say, okay, read your answer out for number three, just to make sure that maybe they've skipped that one, they've gone to the next one. Um, so you, you're giving them a chance. It's not just like you have to have done number two, otherwise it's a demerit, uh, but it's a case of, if you weren't sure, did you ask for help or did you move on? Did you do something within your power to not just sit there for 10 minutes, not doing anything? So again, that comes back to the idea of 100% engagement, 100% of the time. Um, I'm constantly judging everyone's uh, efforts uh, and deciding whether or not I need to push them and help them become someone who makes, puts more effort into lessons and become more independent, become more resilient, uh, or be the kind of person that when you're really stuck, you ask for help or you move on to the next thing. Um, and so it's just about ensuring that the, that you're setting them up to succeed again. So if, if that happens for the first time in my classroom, it might not be a, a consequence. I might just explain, look, this person really struggled with number two, but they just sat there for the, for the rest of the 10 minutes. They didn't put their hand up. And that really upsets me because they're letting themselves down. And when you let yourself down, you let me down. And I can't have you sitting in my classroom, not, not learning anything. Um, you've got to be making sure that you're doing everything in your power. So here are two things that this person could have done. They could have put their hand up and asked for help, or they could have moved on. Right, quickly tell your partners what two things you're going to do next time you're stuck on a question. Go. Three, two, one, all hands up. And then you pick someone and they say those two things. You say, exactly, good. So if I see that again, it is going to be a demerit. So again, you're setting them up for success. You're teaching them how to become better. And then you hold them to account to it going forwards. So I think during independent practice, that kind of uh, early on when you have a class, setting that culture up can be really important, but you're doing it in a supportive way. It's not straight in with a, you know, a consequence when you haven't set them up necessarily, they might not necessarily know that and they might be used to just sitting there and no one's ever said anything to them before, um, or no one's ever spotted that they've done that. And so it's, and you, the only thing you can control is your classroom and you know that that's not something you've addressed ex explicitly before, then you use that as an opportunity to, to, to set that culture. And then you know that going forwards, you can then hold them to account for that. Lovely.